Welcome back to our course, Critical Learnings on Forest and Adivasi Rights. In this lecture, we will discuss the procedure of rights recognition under the Forest Rights Act. This is a very important aspect of the vesting of forest rights since procedural rights or due process are also part of the right to life guaranteed by Article 21 of our Constitution. So far, we have learnt about the different kinds of forest rights recognized under FRA as well as the communities covered by the law. Section 4 of the FRA in particular puts the pre-existing rights of forest dwellers and their relationship to forests at the core of forest governance and conservation. Now, let's come to the procedure for recognition and recording of these rights. The broad strokes are laid down in Section 6 of the Act and the detailed procedures are provided in the rules and various guidelines and circulars. Section 6 of FRA places the Gram Sabha at the core of the rights recognition procedure. The Gram Sabha is the authority to initiate the claims filing, verification and registration process. Once again, as we have learned earlier, remember that the Gram Sabha referred to in FRA is the same as the Gram Sabha defined in PESA. Additionally, under Rule 4.2 of the Forest Rights Rules, the quorum for Gram Sabha meetings is different from that of the ordinary panchayat level Gram Sabha. On the screen, you can see a flowchart depicting the different levels of verification, recommendation and approval that each claim goes through. It traces the process from the Gram Sabha, the Subdivisional Level Committee or SDLC and the District Level Committee or DLC. All three bodies play complementary roles like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle that join up to complete the picture. We shall come back to this flowchart later in this lecture when we discuss the procedure for filing claims. For now, let's look at the forest rights rules and what these say about participation of forest dwelling communities in the claims process. The Gram Sabha constitutes a forest rights committee or FRC of 10 to 15 members from the Gram Sabha. The details of the FRC's composition are shown on the screen. Rule 4.2 lays down what constitutes the quorum for the Gram Sabha meeting. People who are not members of the Gram Sabha cannot be part of the FRC. The FRC assists the Gram Sabha in receiving the claims along with supporting evidence and conducts the physical verification of the claims jointly with the forest and revenue departments. After this, the FRC reports back to the Gram Sabha. The FRC also prepares a community forest resource map along with substantial evidence which then becomes the basis for the approval of a CFR claim by the Gram Sabha through a majority resolution. For more information on CFR rights and claims, you can check out Nagrik Learning's online course on community rights and forest governance. Now the subdivisional level committee and the district level committee are both multi-departmental bodies constituted under the FRA. Section 6.8 of the FRA marks a departure from other forest laws by bringing community members from the panchayats on board the SDLC and DLC. In both these bodies, there is 50% representation of non-government members from the Panchayati Raj institutions. The presence of the non-government members is important for the functioning of these bodies and the proceedings of the committees are not valid in their absence. One of the most important functions of the SDLC is to make information available to the Gram Sabha to assist in the filing of claims such as maps, forest and revenue records, electoral rolls, etc. This responsibility is given to the SDLC so that the Gram Sabhas and forest dwellers can access these resources without facing much problem. The final decision regarding forest rights claims is taken by the DLC. It also has certain other important functions, including ensuring that all PVTGs receive habitat rights in consultation with their traditional institutions. Towards this end, the DLC must ensure that the PVTG's claims for habitat rights are actually filed before the concerned Gram Sabhas. Thirdly, the DLC must also ensure that the PVTGs and other villages where forest dwellers reside receive their CFR rights. Finally, it is the DLC's responsibility to facilitate the filing of claims 
for individual and community rights by pastoral communities before the concerned Gram Sabha. We will round off this lecture with a brief discussion on the procedure for filing claims. There are three forms given in the annexure to the forest rights rules. These forms must be made available by the SDLC to the Gram Sabha. Form A is for the claiming of individual forest rights. Form B relates to community forest rights. And Form C is for Community Forest Resource Rights or CFR rights. Form C was first introduced in 2012 when the rules were amended. Do remember though that before 2012 the claims for CFR rights had been filed via Form B which is perfectly valid. Now on the screen you can see the process map for filing claims. You can also access a copy of this process map in the supplementary document for this lecture. To begin with, the Gram Sabha invites claims from forest dwellers. The claimants must prepare and file their claims before the Forest Rights Committee with at least two pieces of evidence. If there is a gap in the evidence, for example, if the claimant has not attached a map, then the FRC helps them to affix this. Once the FRC has received claims, it begins on-site verification of these in the joint presence of officials from the Forest and Revenue Department. If the officials are absent on two consecutive occasions despite prior intimation, the FRC may proceed to complete the verification without them. In this case, the Gram Sabha's decision regarding the field verification shall be final. After this, based on the verification of the claims, the FRC sends its recommendations on the claims to the Gram Sabha. Once again, please remember that the quorum for Gram Sabha meetings to pass resolutions can be different from the ordinary Gram Sabhas. The Gram Sabha accepts or rejects the verified claims and then passes a resolution accordingly. This resolution is sent to the SDLC, which collates all the claims. The SDLC prepares a blockwise and tehsilwise draft record of proposed forest rights on the basis of the Gram Sabha resolutions. The SDLC forwards this draft record to the DLC. Those claims which are incomplete are remanded by the SDLC to the Gram Sabha with reasons. The Gram Sabha must conduct any further investigation that may be required on the incomplete claims. Most importantly, Rule 12A3 of the Forest Rights Rules states that such a decision or recommendation must be communicated to the claimant in person. The DLC considers the recommendations of the Gram Sabha and the SDLC and accordingly it approves or rejects these. The DLC must provide reasons for any rejection and the same must be communicated to the claimant in person as stated in Rule 12A3. Additionally, any incomplete or erroneous submissions by the Gram Sabha and SDLC are remanded to the Gram Sabha for further investigation with the reasons for remand, just like in Step 8A of our process map. Finally, based on the DLC's decision, a title of rights is signed by the DLC and issued to the claimant by the district administration. There are some additional points to remember throughout the claims filing process. Let's learn some of these. Firstly, there are three categories of evidence accepted in the claims process as laid down in Rule 13 of the Forest Rights Rules. This marks an important departure from the normal rules of evidence contained in the Indian Evidence Act. As we mentioned in Lecture 2.1, evidence of use and occupation of forest land and resources can be provided in the form of fine receipts, encroacher lists, forest offence reports or preliminary offence reports, maps and historical records of rights or privileges, and physical evidence such as traditional structures and burial grounds and so on. Oral evidence of village elders reduced to writing is another important kind of evidence. Please remember that no particular type of evidence has been made compulsory, such as a satellite map or a khatihan. It is this attention to the procedural mechanism that makes the Forest Rights Act an extremely significant law in the field of forest governance in India. In the 2013 case Arch Vahini versus State of Gujarat, 
the Gujarat High Court ruled that the meaning and intent of the FRA should be applied through a constructive approach. The court recognized that, by and large, the beneficiaries of the law are persons who are absolutely illiterate and would hardly possess any such cogent and convincing evidence that would satisfy the authorities. It ruled that a shift in consideration of the evidentiary materials is necessary beyond the established standards of the Indian Evidence Act. Secondly, a Nazari Naksha or hand-drawn map is a perfectly acceptable piece of evidence. Rule 12A11 states that it is not necessary to provide satellite maps in support of claims. The Ministry of Tribal Affairs, or MOTA, has also issued a circular on 27th July 2015 that state governments cannot insist on satellite maps. Instead, where claimants are unable to find any other evidence, the state should assist them by providing satellite maps as supplementary evidence. The third important point relates to CFR claims. For CFR, certain additional forms of physical evidence can be provided such as Nistar rites, fishing and irrigation systems, remnants of structures such as burial or cremation grounds, sacred groves and water bodies, and so on. Interestingly, evidence of ongoing governance and community conservation practices is also relevant, as noted in Rule 13.2. It is the responsibility of the DLC to ensure the recognition of CFR rights under Section 3.1i relating to protection, regeneration, conservation and management of community forest resources and the titles issued. In case no CFR rights are issued in a village, the reasons for this must be recorded by the Secretary of the DLC. The fourth and final major point to remember concerns the review of rejected claims. Early on in the implementation of the FRA, the nodal ministry MOTA found that a large number of claims were being rejected for entirely extraneous reasons. For example, claimants were being told to produce specific kinds of evidence, such as satellite maps or khatihan or even preliminary offence reports. There were numerous instances of OTFD claimants being asked to produce documentary proof of 75 years of residence in the forest. After this, MOTA has issued circulars requiring state governments to review rejected claims so that such legal anomalies are sorted out. Similarly, claims filed using the incorrect form will not be rendered invalid. The law treats such procedural errors as minor, recognizing that forest dwelling communities face many structural barriers such as low literacy rates and limited access to information. So a claim cannot be invalidated or rejected just because the wrong form was filled by the claimant and submitted to the Gram Sabha. Situations have arisen where forest rights claims are rejected without following due process or procedure established by law. In such cases, the claimants can approach the constitutional courts by filing writ petitions and seek directions to the concerned government department to take corrective steps. To conclude, after what we have just learned on the due process requirements under FRA, it is clear how important procedural justice is to the FRA's overall aim of undoing historical injustice. Procedural rights are intrinsically linked to the substantive rights to protect customs, usage, forms, practices and ceremonies which are appropriate to the traditional practices of forest dwellers. Thus, all the provisions of FRA and also the rules and guidelines we have learnt about in this lecture are important. Just like climbing the good stable steps of a ladder, these procedural rights and conditions have an important role to play in ensuring substantive equality for forest dwelling communities so that they continue and their lands continue to survive and thrive for this and coming generations. Thank you for watching.